This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay. Uh, first of all, I apologise for not uh, being able to speak in French. Um, I speak a little bit of French, um, but... And it would be amusing if I tried to speak in French, but um, I'm afraid it wouldn't really be up to the job today, so I'm going to speak in English. And so I appreciate your patience with that. Um, Next, I'd like to thank Fabrice and all the other organisers of this seminar uh, for inviting me to speak uh, in such a prestigious series, in such a prestigious place. And uh, one of the things that I noticed about um, the seminar series, looking through the calendar, is that a lot of your speakers speak about books that they've just published. I believe last week's Richard Watmore did, and and so on. Uh, Others speak on works in progress. Um, What I'm speaking about today is very much work in progress. And in fact, to a very great extent, it's a work in prospectus. I've done some research on this already, and I've published a little bit in the book uh, British America, Creating Colonies, Imagining an Empire, that um, Fabrice mentioned. Um, But because today um, I'm speaking very much prospectively, and uh, what I'm speaking about is something that I hope will become a monograph. This is a sort of interpretative framework of what I hope will be a monograph in about four or five years' time. Um, I'm hoping to publish it in 2018 for obvious reasons, but we'll see whether that works out or not. Um, uh, Because of that, and because it's very broad and interpretive, I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever feedback. Uh, this seminar can give, and obviously that will translate into works that aren't yet published, so um, I appreciate in advance. Even sort of severe criticisms that people like Pierre have promised me already, and so on. (laughs) Um, You know, that might save me from embarrassment later on, so I'd appreciate any and all comments that you have. Um, The paper that I handed over already is... um, Should I wait a second? I carry on? Okay, fine. Um, The paper I'm I'm giving today, I've got quite a lot to pack in. Um, So I'll go over the historiography very briefly, and I'm sorry if I don't do justice to your favourite historian here, but um, you can uh, can bring up that in questions or whatever. Um, So I'll go through the historiography briefly before getting to my uh, interpretation that I hope works. And really I'm talking about two... Uh, historiographies of the Glorious Revolution, one uh, British, one American. On the British side, there is, of course, the old Whig uh, history that celebrated the Glorious Revolution as a landmark in the history of British liberty. That, of course, was sidelined very much from the 1970s by what are still known as uh, revisionist historians who argued that 1688 was neither glorious nor revolutionary, and its only significant effects were really had to do with um, things that were inglorious, the suppression of Roman Catholicism and and disfranchisement of Roman Catholics. More recently, however, we have books by uh, people like Tim Harris, Ted Vallance, Steve Pincus, uh, and others, Um, that talk about the various different effects of the Glorious Revolution, some of which were not glorious at all, some of which perhaps were, if we want to talk about that kind of thing, but were certainly revolutionary. Um, And I'll come back to what I think about that in a bit. On the American side, um, nearly all argue that the Glorious Revolution was indeed a most significant event, And still today, I would say it's arguable, but I'd say that the orthodoxy is still David Lovejoy's 1972 book um, on uh, the Glorious Revolution in America, um, arguing, a little like the old Whig school, that Americans resisted uh, impositions on their liberties from James II and his governors in similar ways to English people uh, back home. The exceptions to this, of course, are people like Stephen Saunders Webb and less controversially and more convincingly, I would say, Owen Stanwood, who argue that the Glorious Revolution had consolidating, centralising effects on empire to one degree or another. But what these historians have in common, I think, is um, that they see the Glorious Revolution as what Richard Dunn has called a transatlantic phenomenon experienced similarly, in whatever way you look at it, in Britain and throughout uh, its American empire at the time. 
The exception to that is Jack Sozin, um, who argues that experiences of the glorious revolution in America were so varied that the, it was really impossible to uh, develop any kind of long term, uh, for it to develop any long term significance at all. So where do I stand on my sort of take on the Glorious Revolution? Uh, where is that coming from in among this uh, historiography? I am, to some degree, with the post-revisionists, uh, the recent historians who've argued that it was significant, which is just as well, because I'm working on an essay for uh, Ted Vallance um, on memories of uh, 17th century revolutions in the 18th and 19th centuries. I'm working on the Re American Revolution. Um, Yet, I also think that their revisionist predecessors made a very important point and a very significant and lasting point about how the protagonists of the Glorious Revolution themselves saw themselves as moderate men and projected the Glorious Revolution as a moderate uh, event, not as a people's revolution, but as a parliamentary restoration of liberties. And that, I think, is one of the keys, as I'll argue in a bit, to understanding, um, ironically, to understanding the ultimate significance and the great significance of the Glorious Revolution. On the American side, I agree with Sozin that the, American Revol uh, the Glorious Revolution was a very variable experience in the American colonies, and yet I also do see it as a transatlantic phenomenon. Um, and one of the problems, I think, in Atlantic history is a tendency to conceive Atlanticness, Atlanticity, whatever, however we want to pronounce it, as essentially a homogenizing force. Um, but I prefer to think of, uh, in this instance, the British Atlantic world, um, or Atlantic worlds generally, as discursive communities, as Jack P. Green has recently referred to them in his latest book on uh, the constitutional history of the American Revolution. A discursive community in which people experience the same events, um, have the same general terms of political reference, but discuss and remember those terms of reference, those events, in very different ways. Uh, and it's in those differences that I think we can find, ultimately, in the long term, the glorious revolution's significance. And it is in the long term um, that I think we, and in an Atlantic perspective, that I think we can really appreciate how, um, gives us a better appreciation of how significant it was in both a British and an American context. Before outlining that and explaining it further, I should note that another influence on me of Jack Green, um, and also John Philip Reed, as many of you would be familiar with his work, um, is that I think that this discursive community um, was very much more concerned with issues of the Constitution rather than with, uh, not to the exclusion of, but more than uh, historians have appreciated since the sort of Bale Bernard Balin paradigm emerged in the 1960s about uh, ideological origins of the American Revolution and so on, a more vague and uh, abstract kind of um, notions about ideology. So constitutionalism is crucially important here, I think. Um, but I'm also interested, more than perhaps Green and Reed, in the interactions of constitutionalism and political culture. Um, political cultures exist in structures, and to some extent, not completely, I don't want to be reductionist about this, for reasons that will be obvious in France, perhaps, as I get to later. Um, political cultures exist in constitutional settings and are to some extent defined by them. So... That was meant to be a brief overview of the historiography um, that I hope will make sense of the interpretation to some extent that I'm about to try to give. Um, and that interpretation, um, to sum it up to start with, it goes like this, that first, ironically, it was a moderate Whig remembrance of the Glorious Revolution, as I mentioned about the, um, uh, the revisionist historians of the Glorious Revolution. So ironically, it was a moderate Whig remembrance of the Glorious Revolution in England, and later after 1607 Britain, that allowed actually a radical transformation of English and from 1707 British constitutionalism and political culture uh, to develop. Second, equally ironically, 
It was a radical Whig remembrance of the glorious revolution in the colonies that allowed there to be no real significant transformation of American constitutionalism and political culture. And the long-term consequences of these differences on either side of the Atlantic could hardly have been more significant, I think. British belief in parliamentary sovereignty and supremacy as secured in British memory of the Glorious Revolution um, accounts for the Sugar Act of 1764, the Stamp Act of 1765, and other imperial reforms and measures that followed. On the other hand, American belief in popular sovereignty and local legislative supremacy, as secured in American memory um, of the Glorious Revolution, accounts for the Declaration of Independence that eventually resulted from those British measures. And one of the things I'm trying out here today, and pushing the boat out a little bit perhaps, is to argue that that uh, legacy on the American side as well as the British side continues to this day through the US Constitution uh, and the kind of political culture that I think it engenders to some extent, including what historians have sometimes called the paranoid style in American politics. And what I'm going to argue is that that comes from the fact that the US Constitution, although often seen as new and modern, is actually much more akin to uh, an ancient or Anglo-Saxon constitution, as is often, uh, as it's remembered anyway, than the modern British constitution is. So, excuse me. Um, beginning then with English experiences <clears throat> uh, and the creation of an English or eventually British memory of the Glorious Revolution. Uh, anxious to avoid repeating the strife of the Jacobean era and even more the bloodshed of 1642-51 and certainly the regicide of 1649 and even the uncertainties of the Restoration era and, uh, well, the Interregnum, the Restoration era. Um, as a result of that, a compromising, consensus-forming and therefore non-revolutionary official interpretation of 1688-89 began to take shape in England even as events were unfolding. The English Convention and Declaration of Rights did not promote radical Whig theories of natural rights or a right to revolution, but stated instead that James's abuses of people's liberties, property and religion absolved them of a duty of loyalty to him. So that when he abdicated, and of course these documents carefully specified that he did indeed abdicate and was not overthrown, Parliament, and not the people, but Parliament, was entitled to restore ancient customs and laws by offering the crown to William and Mary. As Lee Ward has argued, though, this interpretation of events was not merely a sop to anti-revolutionary um, anti Tory sensibility. Uh, radical Whigs may have accepted it out of a spirit of compromise or out of necessity, but moderate Whigs advanced it because they were moderate men. <clears throat> and moreover, they promoted it with enough conviction to make it not only the official version of events at the time, as expressed in the Declaration and Bill of Rights, um, but also the most widely accepted one afterwards. Most post-revolution pamphlets towed the same line, for example, as James Tyrrell's Bibliotheca Politica of 1694, in which a Whig, Mr. Freeman, reassured a Tory, Mr. Meanwell, that the revolution was parliamentary and not popular, and was restorative and not radical. This was a bilateral conversation, not trilateral. Notably absent from a Tyrrell's conversation was any Mr. Radical to make a, a Lockean case for a real revolution with profound constitutional implications. That is, the dissolution of government in accord with natural rights, the right to revolution, and the subsequent formation of new government based on a social contract in accord with the principles of popular sovereignty. Of course, radical interpretations of the Glorious Revolution existed, not least in Locke's two treatises of government, uh, at least if retrospectively read into this post-1688 publication of this pre-1688 work, but also in extensive dissent against the Robinocracy later on from the 1720s, not least, of course, in Cato's letters by Trenchard and Gordon. <clears throat> 
Tory unease remained real as well, at least until Viscount Bolingbroke forced the Tories to accommodate with Walpolean Whiggism. However, uh, one reason why Tory and Whig, radical Whig versions of the Glorious Revolution and its settlement failed to become more popular than they did um, was continuing recollection, well after 1688, of 17th century instability, war and regicide, especially when historical, if not living, memories of those upheavals were jolted by Jacobite uprisings, especially, of course, in 1715, 1745, and even as late as 1759. Also, though, political culture in England changed, thanks in large part, I think, to the Glorious Revolution's constitutional settlement. One of the Glorious Revolution's chief legacies, of course, was the principle of coordination, as expressed in the form of the sovereignty of the Crown in Parliament, which had the effect of turning uh, British political conflict on its axis, um, at least if in Parliament in Westminster, if not always on the street. So the vertical contestations, as I'm inelegantly calling them, um, between um, Crown and Parliament uh, of the 17th century were replaced with more horizontal axis of conflict among parliamentarians in the 18th century. And that transformation allowed, of course, for a more tranquil political culture to emerge, especially as political conflict was further institutionalized in and therefore controlled to some extent by political parties. And as the Toleration Act resolved um, issues of religious sectarianism, at least among Protestants, even if it meant further repression for Catholics. So, for all the conflict that there was, and of course it was considerable, famously, between Tories and Whigs, between moderate Whigs and radical ones, or court Whigs and country Whigs, nevertheless, David Hume could still write, even at the time of the fall of Walpole in the 1740s, that it was in the interest and it was the practice of 18th century Britons, in contrast to 17th century ones, quote, not to contend as if they were fighting pro focus for God and country, but to seek consensus and at least compromise, or at least compromise. But the main reason, I think, why moderate Whig views of the Glorious Revolution prevailed was perhaps that 1688-89 had it seemed, resolved the great conflict between Crown and Parliament, not only peaceably, but in favour of the latter, and therefore in favour of liberty. And in the second half of the, seventh, of the 18th century, few put the case for Parliament's authority more forcefully than Britain's leading legal expert. As William Blackstone said in his commentaries on the laws of England, written, of course, during the American crisis, quote, there is and must be a supreme, irresistible, absolute, uncontrolled authority in which the rights of sovereignty reside. And that authority was, of course, Parliament, not the people. And as he explained in relation to the Glorious Revolution, quote, devolution of power to the people at large includes a dissolution of the whole form of government established by that people, reduces all members to their original state of equality, and by annihilating the sovereign power, repeals all positive laws uh, whatsoever before enacted, something that specifically had not happened in 1688-89, according to this official English interpretation or British interpretation of events. And so for Blackstone, it was because of mixed government of king, lords and commons, monarchy, aristocracy, democracy, that, he said, the idea and practice of political and civil liberty flourish in their highest vigour in Britain. For some, the idea of the crown in Parliament even brought royal luster to Westminster, transforming, according to Edmund Burke, quote, a mere representative of the people, uh, and a guardian of popular privileges for its own immediate constituents into a mighty sovereign. And so, as Linda Colley has argued, a cult of parliament, as she calls it, seems to have emerged in 18th century England and more widely Britain. 
And the cult's following was not limited just to jurists and philosophers like Blackstone and Burke, or just to peers of the realm and common members of parliament, um, or even just to the near quarter of adult men who voted at the time, at least in early 18th century England, it declined a little later. Unenfranchised men and even women petitioned MPs and participated in election day festivals, even in rotten boroughs. And these, of course, are the people to whom uh, the concept of virtual representation applied. And the idea that each MP represented not so much their voting constituents in an actual sense, but rather every British, every single British subject, however high or low, in a virtual sense, itself speaks volumes about the regard that many had for Parliament at the time. Now, others to whom the concept of virtual representation supposedly applied included, of course, the American colonists. And Prime Minister George Grenville's advisor, Thomas Waitley, addressed colonists directly on this matter during the Stamp Act crisis of 1765-66, informing them, in answer to their calls for no taxation without representation, that, quote, all British subjects are really in the same condition. None are actually, all are virtually represented in Parliament. For every member of Parliament sits in the House, uh, not as representative of his own constituents, but as one of that august assembly uh, by which all the commons of Great Britain, uh, in italics, are represented. And Waitley further made sure that Americans were to understand that they were part of Great Britain, by maintaining that the American colonies were part of one nation, along with England, Scotland and Wales, quote, governed by the same supreme authority, that is, Parliament. Now, Waitley's assumption that parliamentary supremacy and sovereignty applied across the Atlantic was widely shared in England. Encouraged as it was by Enlightenment concepts of political ideas and practices as universal laws rather than local contingencies, by a Whig teleology of British history as progress towards liberty, and perhaps not least by praise of Britain's constitution by foreign commentators like Voltaire and Montesquieu. Even Edmund Burke, who of course famously opposed British measures towards the American colonies from 1764 Sugar Act onwards, believed that although it was impolitic for Parliament to legislate for the colonies, it was by no means improper. Uh, we have the clearest right imaginable, he said in Parliament, not only to bind them generally with every law, but with every mode of legislative taxation. Now, the links between <clears throat> post-glorious revolution British constitutionalism and post-Seven Years' War imperial policies are clearly evident in a policy paper written in February 1763 by a former colonial official and later commentator on American affairs, William Knox. And Knox's hints respecting the settlement of our American provinces um, was used by government ministers in preparation of the Sugar Act. Um, many years ago, this was um, these papers were discovered with the word G written on them, probably Lord Grosvenor. They were passed on to Lord Bute, and they were eventually found among the papers of uh, Richard Jenkinson, later Lord Liverpool, um, who played a part in drawing up the American Revenue Bill. So it's right at the centre of what the British were intending when they first started uh, um, taxing the American colonies in 1764. And as well as taxes uh, like that on sugar and its byproducts and stamps and so on, these hints by Knox foreshadowed other British policies as well, including the Proclamation Line of 1763, including the stationing of, quote, eight or 10,000 troops in America that were there, Knox said, not just to protect North America from Native American or future French uh, threats, but to um, impress the American colonists as well. And also various political reforms designed, as he put it, for securing the dependency of the colonies on Great Britain. <clears throat> 
Now, addressing what Knox astutely called the, quote, perpetual struggle in every colony between privilege and prerogative, and believing, uh, end of quote, and believing as well that colonists, not so astutely perhaps, were, quote, not by descent lovers of the monarchy, Knox insisted on parliamentary imprimatur for all of these measures, taxes and other political measures. And to quote him again, the interposition of parliament is necessary, is absolutely necessary for all these purposes, um, because no other authority than that of the British Parliament will be regarded by the colonies or be able to awe them into acquiescence. And there's a certain sort of set of assumptions about the transatlantic translation of the cult of Parliament that was incorrect, but it's interesting that it was assumed. Subsequent British legislation. Beginning with the Stamp Act, then the Sugar Act, uh, sorry, beginning with the Sugar Act, then the Stamp Act, and including, of course, the Declaratory Act of 1766, with its claim that Parliament had full power and authority to make laws and statutes of sufficient force to bind the colonies and people of America, subjects of the Crown of Great Britain, in all cases whatsoever, thus followed logically, if not inevitably necessarily, from British experience and memory of the Glorious Revolution. And yet, of course, Americans saw things profoundly differently and couldn't really have seen things more differently. Following the 1774 Intolerable Acts, John Dickinson, the lawyer, politician, self-styled Pennsylvania farmer, wrote that Parliament's actions over the previous decade um, were a, quote, total contradiction to every principle laid down at the time of the Revolution. Uh, he meant the Glorious Revolution, but it's notable that he didn't have to spell that out or even call it the Glorious Revolution. The Glorious Revolution then, in America as well as in Britain, was the Revolution. And he added that if he and his fellow colonists at the time, rebelling against the British, um, were, uh, were rebels, then they were, quote, rebels in the same way and for the same reason that the people of Britain were rebels for supporting the revolution. The people, that's a significant phrase that I'll be coming back to later on in terms of American memory again of the Glorious Revolution. Now Dickinson had earlier, and with deliberate symbolism, published the first of his letters from a Pennsylvania farm, uh, letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania on November the, si November the 5th, 1767, the anniversary of William's invasion of England at Tor Bay. Clearly then, the Glorious Revolution meant something significant on the other side, on the American side of the Atlantic Ocean, but e equally clearly, it meant something different from what it meant on the British side. So, how did that fundamentally different American memory of the revolution emerge and develop? Uh, and what were its legacies? Now there are, <clears throat> as historians like David Lovejoy and others have said, parallels between the experiences of provincials and metropolitans in the later Stuart era. First and foremost, James, Duke of York, governed his proprietorship of New York without a representative assembly for 19 years from 1664 when England took it from the Dutch to 1683. As James II, from uh, 1685, he turned New York and New Jersey into royal colonies, arbitrarily abolished the private charters of Plymouth, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, and consolidated all seven eventually into the Dominion of New England, which, on the model of a Spanish imperial vice royalty, he once again ruled without a representative assembly. On a smaller scale, there, were also, there was also Charles Calvert, the third Lord Baltimore, proprietor of Maryland, and a Catholic like James. His alleged tyranny and favoritism towards Catholics caused a minor rebellion accompanied by a pamphlet called A Complaint from Heaven with Hue and Cry from Maryland in 1776, the same year as Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia. And some of those involved in Maryland's 1676 Hue and Cry would subsequently be members of the self-styled Protestant Association that overthrew the Maryland proprietorship and the Calverts in 1689. Yet colonists also had 
distinctive grievances in the late Stuart era. And some of these were with Parliament rather than with the Crown uh, or with local authorities. It was Parliament, um, for example, that created the navigation system. Indeed, it was the revolutionary regicidal rump Parliament during the interregnum that passed the founding navigation ordinance of 1651. And that navigation system, like economic and political interventions in colonial affairs by the Lords of Trade from 1676, when it was created, was a specific colonial concern. Also, local factors made colonial glorious revolutions different from each other and from the one in England or the ones in the British Isles. First, in early 1689, when news of the late 1688 Glorious Revolution reached America, most governors declared their colonies for William and Mary and thereby averted revolts. There were uprisings in only three American colonies, all different from each other. The overthrow of Edmund Andros in um, Boston, he of course was James's uh, governor of the Dominion of New England, restored Massachusetts and the other New England colonies to their original charters. In New York, Jacob Leisler's insurgents forced Andros's deputy, Francis Nicholson, to flee, and then they implemented the Charter of Liberties, which was first drawn up as a remonstrance against arbitrary government in 1683, after James, the Duke of York's then governor, Thomas Dongan, um, reluctantly called an assembly when he finally needed uh, money and couldn't raise it any other way. Also, the involvement of economically declining artisans and politically disfranchised Dutch people, uh, because of course New York was New Netherland before 1664, meant, as Simon Middleton has argued, that New York's glorious revolution was less an imperial event and more a domestic struggle. Finally, while New Englanders threw off royal rule and reverted to their private charters, and while New York threw off royal rule in favour of self-government under a self-devised new charter, Marylanders overthrew the private proprietorship of Lord Baltimore and requested royal government instead. So, many different complicated uh, connotations of all of those different events. Also, as historians have pointed out, in defending these actions subsequently, colonists cited their rights as freeborn Englishmen in declarations and bills of rights, much like the Whigs in England had done. Another sign for some of the transatlantically unifying nature of the Glorious Revolution in America as well as in Britain. Often quoted in this regard is Increase Mather's claim in his Vindication of New England that, quote, no Englishmen in their wits will ever venture their lives and estates, excuse me, to enlarge the king's dominions abroad and enrich the whole English nation if their reward, after all, must be to be deprived of English liberties. And English liberties, again, is in uh, italics for emphasis. Yet colonial pamphleteers sometimes specified their status as Englishmen abroad. I think when people see that, they often hear Englishmen. I think we need to hear a little bit more about abroad. And they often did that in order to counter the claim made in England, um, often made in England, that colonist rights were contingent upon uh, a compact with the mother country that was determined by the mother country. And it's quite clear, I think, in Mather's words, that for him, migrants did not go overseas and then negotiate for the restoration of their rights as Englishmen. Rather, they took their rights as freeborn Englishmen in the phraseology of the time with them when they left and negotiated their relationship with English government once they were there in their own terms, not in English terms. And inherent, I'd say, in this uh, historical construction by Mather of migration and settlement, there's at least an incipient or at least a germ of an idea uh, of colonist rights as natural rights, rather than their rights being contingent on subjecthood or citizenship or any other such thing. <clears throat> but it was the outcomes of the Glorious Revolution in each of the colonies that made provincial experiences most distinctive. In the short term, 
only Marylanders got what they wanted from their revolt. And even then, royal rule only lasted until 1715, when Benedict Leonard Calvert, the fourth Lord Baltimore, converted to Anglicanism and got his proprietary back, albeit with diminished uh, political powers. In New York, Jacob Leisler and his son-in-law, Jacob Milburn, were hanged as traitors. Following a brief delay in handing over power to the new royal governor who arrived in 1691. In 1692, a new charter reimposed royal rule on Massachusetts and abolished Plymouth Colony altogether. Moreover, in the longer term, <clears throat> neither king nor parliament acknowledged colonial declarations of rights. There was, therefore, no glorious revolution settlement in any of the colonies or in the empire at large comparable to that which came about in England. And so, in partial contrast to the spirit of self-government that colonists thought had been established or reasserted in 1689, a new board of trade from 1696 began administering and the Royal Navy and Vice Admiralty Courts began enforcing a reinvigorated navigation system. Also, Crown officials continued exec um, exercising executive powers in the colonies that were abandoned in England after James's overthrow, including determining if and when assemblies would meet, proroguing and dissolving assemblies, vetoing legislation, creating courts, dismissing judges, and so on. In America then, 1688-89 did not seem restorative and did not resolve anything in the way it seemed to in Britain. It was just another moment, albeit a significant one, in an ongoing conflict between colonial privilege and imperial prerogative, um, 17th century style. Um, with all the features familiar from the Civil War era. Most significant, perhaps, there were no governors in assembly in the colonies as there was a crown in Parliament in Britain. No principle of coordination that could mediate colonial or imperial politics, as was the case in England's or later Britain's domestic politics. In the empire, therefore, that vertical axis of political conflict between colonial, legislative, and imperial executive power remained the primary one. And colonial constitutionalism and in turn American political culture consequently retained 17th century characteristics. It was polarized, antagonistic, confrontational, even paranoid, driven by unbending constitutional and ideological principle, and with convictions unmediated by the compromises inherent in party politics. Yet, the fact that imperial authorities consequently found it difficult to implement their will, and only attempted to do so intermittently before 1764, confirmed colonists' sense that the Glorious Revolution and its settlement had indeed asserted their right to self-government, although to the British it had done no such thing. Certainly, like Englishmen, colonists chose to assert legislative supremacy. But for colonists, that meant the supremacy of their own local assemblies, certainly not that of Parliament. And it also often meant supremacy rather than necessarily sovereignty. If the crown in Parliament was sovereign in Britain, the people were often sovereign in America, as, is recent, as has recently been powerfully argued by Craig Urish. Indeed, when Parliament began taxing and in turn intensifying political interference in the colonies after the Seven Years' War, colonists expressed theories of diffused and popular sovereignty that derived directly from their interpretations of the Glorious Revolution and its settlement. In 1764, James Otis, in the first of the great pamphlets of the Revolutionary Era, cited the Glorious Revolution as an example very much in contrast to how British people we saw earlier interpreted it. He saw it as a real revolution, to quote him. That is, a governmental dissolution in which political power, quote, devolves to the people who have a right to resume their original liberty and by the establishment of a new legislative, such as they shall think fit, 
provide for their own security, uh, safety and security, which is the end for which they are in society. Otis didn't mean that this glorious revolution represented a full-scale dissolution of society and a return to the state of nature, followed by the formation of an original social contract. But 1689, nevertheless, was a moment when the colonists made or remade their contract with the British Empire in an equal negotiation between two uh, sets of people. Um, and that compact was... Uh, violated, according to Otis and others, by the sugar and then putative stamp act. For Otis, that contract granted Parliament superordinate authority uh, over the sea and over trade, which justified the navigation system, but colonists remain, retained competence over local affairs, especially taxation, exclusively within their own legislative assemblies. 1689 also established, according to Otis and others, the British Crown as a kind of imperial arbiter. In fact, as Brendan McConville powerfully argues, colonists developed a deep attachment to the British monarchy, one that was only sundered, and perhaps all the more bitterly for that, when the king failed in his duty to protect um, American colonists from parliamentary tyranny. Thus, from as early as the Townsend Crisis of 1767 and following the Declaratory Act of 1766, colonists ceased addressing Parliament in their petitions and pamphlets, as Otis had done, and began addressing the King about Parliament. Ten years on from Otis, and following the Intolerable Acts that of course closed the port of Boston and imposed more or less military government on Massachusetts after the Boston Tea Party, Thomas Jefferson's summary view of the rights of British America addressed George III directly uh, to, quote, earnestly entreat His Majesty, as yet the only mediatory power within the several states of the British Empire, to recommend to his Parliament of Great Britain the total revocation of these acts. It's counterintuitive, I know, to think of Americans as so pro-monarchical, but I think they really were just before the American Revolution. Jefferson knew he was assuming enormous executive prerogative here and noted that George III and, quote, and his ancestors, conscious of the impropriety of opposing their single opinion on the united wisdom of two houses of parliament, while their proceedings were unbiased by interested principles, for several ages past have modestly declined to exercise of this power in that part of his empire um, called Great Britain. And it's fairly clear in that statement that Jefferson saw the empire, first of all, as l less as an empire than as a federation of what he explicitly called states. And as he went on to say, quote, the addition of new states to the British empire has produced an addition of new and sometimes opposed interests. It is now, therefore, the great office of his majesty to resume his exercise of his negative power and to prevent the passage of any laws by one legislature of the empire which might bear injuriously on the rights and interests of another. Now, if Jefferson wished for a return of the royal veto, he was more shy about the idea of legislative dissolution, and he was so in direct reference to 1688-89. Quote, since the establishment of the British Constitution at the Glorious Revolution on its free and ancient principles, neither His Majesty nor his ancestors have exercised such a power of dissolution in the island of Great Britain. And when His Majesty was petitioned by the united voice of his people there to dissolve the present Parliament, who had become obnoxious to them, his ministers were heard to declare an open Parliament that His Majesty possessed no such power by the Constitution. He again asked, though, uh, will it not appear strange to an unbiased observer that that of Great Britain was not dissolved while those of the colonies have repeatedly incurred that sentence? Now, it might also seem strange to us that radical Whigs in America like Jefferson, who believed in the right to revolution and popular sovereignty, should regard the monarchy so much more highly uh, than moderate Whigs in Great Britain did even to the point of accepting the idea of the return of veto power, which, of course, is anathema 
to 18th century English people or Britons. But this seeming paradox reflected, I think, perhaps a, Lo a Lockean notion that what mattered more than constitutional details were natural rights, and so the people could establish whatever form of government they wished as long as they did not alienate the unalienable rights. In any case, tyranny could come from anywhere and everywhere. With no reverence for Parliament, Jefferson noted that, quote, bodies of men as well as individuals are susceptible to the spirit of tyranny. So much so that he rejected Parliament's superordinate in a move further from Otis, rejected Parliament's superordinate authority over the seas and excoriated the Navigation Acts as arbitrary exercises of uncontrolled power. And warming to that theme, I always find this quite amusing. He called the Hat Act of 1732 an instance of despotism to which no parallel can be produced in the most arbitrary ages of British history. Now, the Hat Act, of course, forbade colonial hat makers um, from selling their wares overseas. So Jefferson's analysis here might have been stretching the point uh, rather far. But... And perhaps there's something about the hyperbolic, even paranoid nature of American political rhetoric. On the other hand, one wonders what Britons would have thought if the Virginia House of Burgesses had passed a law forbidding English hatmakers from selling their headwear in America. And for Jefferson, that was perfectly analogous, because his main point was that all the states in the British Empire, Virginia, etc., and Great Britain, were equal. And as he put it with his celebrated clarity, quote, the British Parliament has no right to exercise authority over us. Jefferson thus argued in his summary view that especially from 1764, quote, a series of oppressions begun at a distinct, pe distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers to plainly prove a deliberate systematic plan of reducing us to slavery, end of quote almost exactly the same language he would use in the Declaration of Independence two years later. And except, of course, the one notable feature of the Declaration of Independence is that it, of course, famously fails to refer to Parliament by name, mentioning it only as others with whom the king had combined to oppress the American colonists. And that silence, I think, speaks volumes about the absence of awe with which colonists regarded uh, the British Parliament, and in turn about the vastly differing and in and combination enormously consequential uh, um, legacies of the glorious revolution in the Atlantic world. To conclude, uh, the glorious revolution was fundamental to the constitutional and ideological conflicts of the American Revolution. It bequeathed to the British a blinding reverence to the supremacy of Parliament that rendered Britons unable to envision shared sovereignty um, and an equally blinding political culture of institutionalised moderation that rendered Britons unable to comprehend the source and depth of American anger at the Sugar Act and subsequent measures. Americans, however retained an equally profound attachment to local legislative sovereignty or else to colonial legislative supremacy based on popular sovereignty and, in turn, a political culture of institutionalised antagonism that predated the Glorious Revolution and was reconfirmed by their memory of the Glorious Revolution. The ironies are that a moderate Whig interpretation of the Glorious Revolution as non-revolutionary permitted these radical transformations of British constitutionalism and political culture, while, as I say, a radical Whig interpretation of 1688-89 permitted the perpetuation of 17th century constitutionalism and political culture in America. And that perpetuation has carried through to today in forms incorporated in the US Constitution that is still with us, of course. And the ideological and indeed literary debts that the US Bill of Rights of 1791 owes to the British one of, 17, of 1689 are well noted. Not least, the Second Amendment to the US Constitution is a feature, almost word for word, of the British Bill of Rights. 
But less well noted, perhaps, are what the American political system, what its structure in the original constitution owes to the 17th century and to a kind of pre-glorious revolution politics that continued to prevail in America after the glorious revolution. The US Constitution is often held up as something new in the world, something radical, and in some ways, of course, it was. The idea of popular sovereignty may date to the 17th century or even earlier, but its institutionalization in fundamental law via the words, we the people of the United States, was new when it was drafted in 1787 and then implemented in 1789. But in other ways, the US political system predates or structure predates 1688. And in some of these respects, more closely resembles, I would argue, uh, an idea or a memory of an ancient or Anglo-Saxon constitution um, than the modern post-1688 British constitution does. Post-glorious revolution, British constitutionalism puts much more emphasis uh, than its ancient version did on mixed powers, on the principle of coordination based on executive control of the legislature, um, but with that firmly based within the legislature. The American one, however, retains more separated powers. The US presidency, uh, the US president rather, like the French one, but not like the French one. And that's why I said at the beginning that political constitutionalism only goes part of the way to explain changes in political culture. But in the Amer I'm talking about American context here. If we want to, we can come back to why it's different in France. Um, but the US president is, of course, elected separately from both houses of Congress that are elected separately from each other. And the executive incumbent in America is often in political opposition to the majority of the membership of one or both of those legislative houses, um, which, of course, can't really happen in the British parliamentary system, where the executive, by nature, by constitutional process, controls the legislature. Um, and the same system is replicated in every one of the 50 states as well as in the federal government. So none of the 51 US governments follows the British parliamentary model. And this old-fashioned polar polarity in, United, in the United States between executives and legislatures in, is a pre-1688 thing and encourages to this day what historians and political science, scientists have sometimes called a paranoid style in American political culture. Um, and I think it is a political culture that would have been recognizable to English people before 1688. Now, it's true, of course, that the modern United States has its products of the age of reason. And Barack Obama, for example, seems to me a perfect modern incarnation of a moderate Whig. But Barack Obama does so much rhetorical reaching out, so much political compromising, indeed so much moderation, because of uh, what or maybe who is ranged against him. <clears throat> Excuse me, the right wing of the Republican Party, the Tea Party, uh, the NRA, the birthers, and also their wilder cousins in uh, the militias who reject government altogether. Um, and these people seem to me to be the peculiar uh, in all senses and uh, bastard in, uh, some in both senses as well, offspring of 17th century English radicals and high Tories. And that's perhaps one of the less glorious uh, survivals of the Glorious Revolution. And at that point, I end. Thank you.